So hi everybody, welcome to the TST meeting for Onos. Uh, it's been about a month or so since we held one, um, due, both uh, due to lack of topics as well as due to the uh, efforts on Loom release. And uh, today uh, Jordan's going to uh, present his proposal for the distributed uh, protocol for achieving the in-service so in software upgrade functionality for Onos. And with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Jordan, and I'll give you the presenter privileges. All right. So uh, recently, I've been uh, developing, sort of planning for a new protocol for ISSU. So we've done a bit of work in the Loon release uh, towards ISSU, and this uh, I created this document, which I can share in the, the notes, uh, sort of proposing a new protocol for ISSU. We don't have to read through this document right now. I put it in slides, and so I'm going to sort of go through those slides and talk about uh, basically what this document says. Oh, not correct. All right. Mm. So, uh, so what I'm going to go over uh, in these slides is sort of what the work that we've done in the Loon release, uh, the limitations of that that work, uh, basically why we needed uh, to improve upon the ISSU process, uh, a description of the protocol that I'm developing, uh, how it overcomes the limitations that I mentioned about the the current implementation of ISSU, and sort of a timeline for how long it's going to take to develop this protocol. So the Loon release. So basically what we focused on in the Loon release was sort of foundational work for ISSU. So a lot of the storage underlying Onos uh, used custom serializers and things like that. And what we determined was that the first thing that we needed was to sort of use a <coughs> standardized uh, serialization format that would allow us to communicate across across different versions of the software uh, during upgrades. <clears throat> and so it was a major refactoring effort of the Raft protocol and all the, the state that's uh, persisted on disk. And so <clears throat> basically we, we've been using Cryo for, for this serialization for a long time and it would have been a huge effort to replace Cryo. So what we did was uh, use some of the existing functionality in Cryo that allows uh, both forward and backwards compatible uh, serialization. So, you know, version one nodes can communicate with version two nodes, and version two nodes can communicate with version one nodes. And so, what this what this gives us really is a first implementation of ISSU where uh, clusters can be upgraded just by in updating their individual nodes. Uh, and this works as long as uh, major changes to the logic and protocols and things like that aren't aren't weren't added between the releases. So that brings me to the limitations of this. And so you know, upgrading upgrading clusters using this approach where uh, we can communicate across different versions and you can just upgrade individual nodes. It it still doesn't account for tons of different problems like uh, changes to uh, storage patterns, data structures, protocols, and other application logic. For instance, uh, you know, if a store, uh, if a store is refactored to use a different primitive, how does the state get from the old primitive to the new primitive in an upgrade? If uh, during the, in the Loon release, right before the Loon release, I changed one of the primitives, the document tree primitives partitioning strategy. So it was moved from one partition to using all the partitions. So how does state that's stored in that one partition get moved to all the other partitions in an upgrade? And then uh, one of the issues that Sarov brought up to me was in applications, you know, what what if uh, two different versions of the same application want different flows? And so while the cluster is running with two different versions, they're uh, both trying to install conflicting flows. Basically, uh, 
because they're sharing sort of the same uh, distributed flow rule store that causes problems where both versions see the other versions flows. <laughs> and so uh, the other thing is uh, there are no, there's no real mechanism to prevent incompatible upgrades and no mechanism to roll back failed upgrades. And so that, out of that comes sort of a, a list of requirements for what a more thorough uh, ISSC protocol would, would include. <laughs> and so some of those things are uh, the ability to isolate store and application state and communication so that, like I said, new, a new version of application doesn't uh, do things that conflict with the old version of the application. Uh, similarly, just like with the, the changes to primitives, uh, some mechanism that allows us to transform uh, from the way that state is stored in one version to the way state is stored in another version. A uh, mechanism for rolling back failed upgrades uh, and the preservation of fault tolerance guarantees throughout the process. And so what I'm gonna talk about now is a uh, sort of the outline of the protocol that I developed that that uh, sort of solves these problems and then we'll go over how it accounts for all the limitations that I just mentioned. <clears throat> all right, so sort of the first step of this, so, so the protocol is really just a series of uh, commands that do things to, to upgrade the, the cluster and I'll talk about what those commands actually do. So the first step is uh, log into the cluster and run an ISSC init command. And so the this initialization phase, what it does is that uh, sets uh, most of the stores inside of Onos into read-only mode, and I'll talk about why that is uh, in a little bit. The second step is uh, upgrade a subset of the nodes in the cluster. And so the important thing to note about this is you're beginning to see uh, sort of the approach to doing the upgrade where this uh, image is showing uh, some set of devices that are connected to some set of nodes. The yellow nodes are the old versions nodes and the green nodes are the new versions nodes. And what you see is mastership is kind of being stuck to the old version. And so this protocol is gonna use mastership to switch from uh, one version to the next when it's ready. And so after, after uh, ISSC was initialized and when nodes are being upgraded, uh, the device mastership stays on the old nodes. And then, so obviously the next step is to uh, actually switch the mastership. So you use a ISSU upgrade command and that switches from the old version to the new version. And so uh, this, this allows us to do sort of an instantaneous switch where uh, the, entire, the entire topology is being controlled by either one version or another version, not, not a mixture of versions at the same time. <laughs> Next step is uh, log in to the cluster and verify that everything looks good. And so this is sort of a step that says, uh, does everything look good? And if not, I can uh, roll it back later. So it gives uh, administrators sort of an opportunity to make sure everything's going well and we're not automating automatically breaking the cluster. Although it could be sort of partially automated in the future. And then based on that information, uh, if, the, if the upgrade is good to go, if everything is working properly on the new version, upgrade the remaining nodes and run ISSU commit to uh, say that the upgrade is complete and this is the new version of the cluster. And at that time, mastership is rebalanced among all the nodes. Or the alternative is, my, this thing's not switching, there we go. Or the alternative is roll back and upgrade. And so rolling back is simply just a matter of switching mastership back to the old cluster uh, and then restoring the state on the upgraded nodes. And so in the uh, in the event that upgrade needs to be rolled back, mastership is changed over and then the, the, the read-only mode on all the stores is released and the, that subset of the cluster uh, continues behaving as normal. So there are obviously some oddities about this, like, uh, some questions that need to be answered because, you know, one, uh, we're, it sort of seems like uh, we're taking away uh, some fault tolerance here or something like that. And so the question is, how does this overcome all these limitations that I, I mentioned? 
So the first is isolation. So the important thing to note about uh, about the sort of first stage of the upgrade process, which is this one. So when we up upgrade a subset of a cluster is during this process, uh, we isolate state to within each version of the cluster. So the old version, this old version of the cluster can only see the old version state and the new version of the cluster will actually copy the old version state and start sort of form a new logical cluster from a snapshot of the old cluster state. So yeah, upgraded nodes basically, when, it, when the first node is upgraded, it connects to all the other partitions, copies their uh, commit logs, and uh, forms new raft partitions uh, from, from those copies of the commit log. Similarly, each of the upgraded nodes only have a view of when they, when they access the cluster's configuration through the cluster service or whatever it's called. Uh, they can only see nodes that are within their version, so they can only communicate with nodes that are within their version. And so this prevents, uh, this sort of avoids other, other like application level conflicts or applications or stores communicate with each other uh, outside of uh, consensus protocols and things like that. <laughs> and then read-only mode. So the rationale for read-only mode on the old subset of the cluster is that state doesn't, we don't get split brain where uh, modifications are still being made to the old subset of the cluster and the new sub subset of the cluster at the same time because uh, once the new subset of the cluster state diverges from the old, uh, changes to it won't be, changes to the old subset won't be reflected in the new subset. And so this diagram sort of illustrates uh, the copying of partitions. So, and really basically what we're doing is creating uh, versioned, versioned RAF partitions or versioned partitions of uh, consistent primitives. <coughs> so the new, the new subset of the cluster comes up and connects to all these partitions and uh, copies them over and forms new partitions. So state migration. So one of the other limitations that I mentioned was how do we modify state that's sort of the location change or the, the primitive that the state is stored in changes in a new version. And so this becomes sort of sort of simple with this protocol where uh, because new nodes, upgraded nodes are coming up with, with a snapshot of the, the old nodes, the, old, the state of the old subset of the cluster, uh, all they have to do is read that and make any modifications they want. And that doesn't risk uh, that doesn't risk the ability to roll back because the old cluster, the old subset of the cluster, is still operating on a on a sort of static snapshot of of its state, and we can always roll back to that. So yeah, basically, in in the initialization of services, all they have to do is uh, read state and modify it as they wish. The other thing is rollbacks. So this sort of, this protocol really simplifies rollbacks quite obviously because uh, rolling back to the old version of the cluster is simply a matter of reassigning mastership back to the old subset of the cluster. So like I said, the old subset of the cluster uh, preserves the state at the start of upgrade time. So rolling back to that state uh, is just a matter of switching mastership and re releasing uh, locks so that can, uh, operate normally. And the other interesting thing is that, so one of the sort of alternatives that's obvious here is why don't we just start a parallel cluster, uh, copy all the state from the, the old cluster to the upgraded cluster, and then switch mastership. But there's the complication there is updating actual devices and with uh, the locations of, of the controller nodes. <laughs> And so instead, uh, up, updating those nodes or upgrading those nodes in place uh, reduces a lot of complexity in uh, the configuration of the rest of the network. And then uh, fault tolerance. So there are sort of two, two components to how we can uh, preserve fault tolerance throughout this process. So the first is uh, fault tolerance for the old subset of the cluster. So the good thing is that so this sort this diagram sort of shows how uh, partitions are typically spread across an Onos cluster. So the orange partitions sort of show how it would 
uh, normally be, be spread. So uh, essentially when, when new nodes come up, they can still participate in the consensus protocols for the old nodes, but they just don't have access to them. But we can't have forward consensus, forward compatible consensus protocols. So the new nodes, uh, that's why the new nodes have to form their own RAP partitions. And so by the, by the new nodes uh, participating in consensus for the old nodes, the old nodes are still fault tolerant and they can tolerate the same number of failures as they would normally be able to tolerate. But what's obvious from this diagram actually is since the new nodes are forming small partitions initially, when one node, when the first node started, it's going to form one node partitions that are not fault tolerant. Similarly, these two node partitions are not fault tolerant. So what if a failure happens to one of the new nodes? What if, what if you upgrade uh, one node, switch mastership to it, and then it crashes? And then uh, none of the, the, the network is even being controlled by anything. And so the obvious way to deal with that is by rolling back upgrades when failures are detected to new nodes. So essentially, uh, after mastership is switched from the old subset of the cluster to the new subset, uh, old nodes will old nodes will uh, just monitor new nodes for failures in the event that a failure is detected through the normal failure detection algorithm. Uh, they'll just automatically roll back the, the upgrade to to tolerate those failures. So that's pretty much the protocol and the rationale for it. Uh, questions? All right, so a little bit about, about the timeline for this. So, Jordan, uh, one quick yeah. question. Um, sure. Do, with, do we have a problem with like a doubling of state that occurs during the, the upgrade? What do you mean? Like uh, when we have to bring up all new partitions and we're doing data migration to those new partitions? Yep. Eventually be done across every store in the system? So do we have a doubling of, of state for the duration of the migration? Uh, yes. I mean, yeah, there's a, there's duplicate state uh, until, so yeah, state will be duplicated and uh, for the duration of the migration, then once the migration is complete, uh, old partitions are just deleted because the new partitions have all the history of the old partitions. So basically, we're yeah, we're just uh, we're just uh, sort of cloning cloning the old partitions and then continuing on from there. And eventually, the the yeah, that's actually the other part of the ISSU commit command that I missed, which is old state is cleaned up. So what this this translates to into just a little bit of a peak a demand for um, for resources, primarily I would assume RAM resources uh, on, uh, yep. on those, uh, especially on the minority nodes, right? Right, on the new nodes, yeah. So this, this shows, yeah, so there's a doubling of partitions that's gonna be sort of expensive uh, for those new nodes. Yep. And, yep. but as, as the upgrade progresses, partitions will be spread back out across the cluster again. Yeah. But yeah, through, until, until the ISSU commit command is run, there's double the state being managed and double the memory in, inside this. Clearly, this is something we would have. It's possible that. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, it's possible that we could do things to uh, preserve, sort of preserve resources for one of, so for one of the set of sets of partitions. Like right now, uh, a lot of the RAF protocol uses like memory map files. We can unmap files in one one side of the cluster to sort of reduce the resource usage. Yeah, but I think memory is, uh, you know, reasonably cheap. Um, and this uh, sort of an approach does allow us to cut some complexity that we would have to, that we would encounter otherwise. So, I mean, it's something we would have, to yeah. we'll have to document that, that we require certain headroom with respect to uh, RAM uh, primarily and, uh, do you see any issues with that, Brian? Uh, 
No, uh, yeah, I guess my my only my only concern was uh, just instability that could be introduced as a result of beginning a migration. If you're running sort of near capacity across a larger cluster, uh, reducing that capacity by half in order to perform an upgrade uh, was the only like if that causes a crash, um, then failing back to a subset of the nodes. Um, or introducing a subset, like the old subset of nodes, if that crashes uh, due to resource limitations, yeah, um, then you're kind of just hosed, right? Yeah, completely. Yep. There's something requires, you can roll back. Yeah, this requires that you definitely run with some headroom. I mean, not necessarily just RAM, but even I/O, for example, right? Because if you have, right. uh, if you're running near capacity with respect to the uh, potential connections or managing potential sessions to the devices. And if you were to now suddenly cut it in, you know, half, clearly then could, they could cause things to fail. And so clearly there has to be some headroom. Yeah, so the, but the old set, the old subset of nodes, the only overhead that they have during the first sort of stage where uh, nodes are being upgraded, the only overhead they have is Sending logs to the new nodes. Yeah, I, I was not. Yeah, I was not necessarily talking about even like the memory or the raft logs. I was actually talking about the ability to connect to the uh, controlled environment. Because, for example, if we were to do some scaling tests, uh, there were some scaling tests done that indicated that beyond certain number of switches per node, the connection right. would start to drop because uh, the I/O resources were being saturated. That's a good point. All right. Anything else? Nothing. This is great. So timeline. So what? So a lot of the initial work that I mentioned uh, in the Loon release. I did myself because it was easier to go through and refactor lots of the lower level code. But where we're starting now is an ISSU brigade that we're going to have our first meeting uh, after Ono's build and probably hopefully get some more people uh, involved. And so, like I mentioned in the Loon release, what we have now is just uh, the ability to uh, store objects in a manner that can be read by different versions of the cluster. And that's a lot that is really that functionality is really critical to the protocol that I just described. And so uh, in the M release, uh, we should be able to implement a lot of this protocol. I mean, because a lot of it is just uh, usage of functionality we, that we already have. Obviously, mastership is something that we have, and it should be pretty simple to uh, <laughs> switch between old and new uh, versions. We have, uh, we already replicate node version information. So coordinating that process is simple. And then uh, the ability to uh, copy and sort of fork uh, the state of the consensus protocols is already built into them and it has been there for a long time. It's just never been used much. <laughs> and so, those are the types of things that we'll aim for the Magpie release, uh, just to have this, have all the commands for this protocol and the ability to actually run the upgrade process. And then uh, in the next release, we can focus on uh, the ability to roll back upgrades and handle failures and things like that. One <laughs> comment slash question that I had for you, Jordan. Yes. So you mentioned so we, that we're going to put the system, the um, ISSU in it is going to put the system in a read-only mode. At least yep. the stores, right? But right. I think there is still, there will still, there are components, you know, the, the stores themselves are reasonably passive in a sense they're generally always driven by the managers, which is sort of the, sort of the, the prime component, the responsible for the subsystem. And uh, that yep. just information from either users or from the environment and then in response to receiving feedback from those two di different boundaries, they then usually try to operate on the, on the um, stores. And so my question was, do you foresee a need to come up with some sort of a either eventing or, or some sort of a callback hook type uh, 
um, service which would which would allow the components which consider themselves to be upgradable to yep. register with such a system so that they can coordinate, you know, the quiet period and then a roll, or to kind of have a coordinated rollback and, uh, and commit type behaviors. Yeah, so this was sort of the initial approach that I was thinking about for ISSU, uh, was uh, building a central sort of upgrade service that uh, <clears throat> understands the, the state of the cluster when, when all the nodes are upgraded and can uh, call call hooks for individual services to do whatever they want to upgrade state or rollback state. I'm not sure. I, I What I'm not sure about is the extent to which this makes that idea obsolete by uh, isolating state and just preserving the state of the old cluster to roll back to. <coughs> and I think there are a lot of questions yet as to uh, what what setting the stores to read only mode means because uh, the fact is that they can't be entirely set to read only mode for lots of reasons uh, that uh, aren't even necessarily application specific but i uh, i don't know there's there's a lot of details to work out as to uh, the the, use, the uses of read only mode the idea of forking sort of the state of the cluster and whether we need to provide additional mechanisms for for services to uh, react to changes in the version of the cluster, I I'm not sure yet. <laughs> I see. Yeah, I was mostly not. I was not necessarily sort of suggesting that we drive it through that service, but at least to provide some yep. sort of a notification to the software as to where the upgrade process currently is and to also sort of give them a courtesy notice so that they could, right. they could abstain from certain activities. For example, if the store is, like you mentioned, stores can be placed in read only state for other reasons, right? But if a store, generally in that case, if it's if it stores is played in a, like in a read only state and the manager component still tries to pump state into it, this is likely to generate some errors or exceptions or potentially sort of uh, uh, anomalous uh, uh, right. artifacts in the logs. And the whole idea is that if this is an expected scenario, we probably ought to have means in place that would suppress that. Um, That's true. So I guess, I guess the way that I was thinking about it was that maybe an application attempts to to change something in the system that it shouldn't change and it should be handling exceptions and saying, oh, I can't change that state. But I guess, yeah, the alternative is to actively tell things that they can't change state ahead of the time. So, yeah. and there's probably, there could be good good reason for doing that. Yeah, and the idea here, this is more like a court, like a FYI. Right? It's just say, you know, you should go quiet. We're going, we're putting in a read only state. And then the application can choose to you know, act on it in different ways. And it could be that there are applications or components which are not at all aware of this sort of a service and will simply proceed doing what they're doing, or, or they may not need to be known because the types of things that they're doing will not encounter that situation, so they can be bothered. But, but my thought was that if there was such a coordination service uh, where yeah. those things that require this information can obtain. Yeah, that that could make sense. My my only uh, my only thought would be that we can't rely on it because there's a risk that people people write applications that don't pay attention to upgrades oh, and they oh, modify things anyways. Com completely agree. This is purely just uh, kind of an FYI. Uh, the the actual yeah. enforcement will be done at the level of the storage service effectively. Yeah. Yeah, completely agree. Good idea. Anything else? Oh, this, this is great. It sounds like a good plan uh, in terms of kind of the, the order of importance uh, as far as the, for the timeline. Yeah, so I want to mention that anybody that sees this uh, that's interested in, in joining in in this, this effort, we have a, uh, a Slack channel, the Brigade ISSU Slack channel. We just set up a Google group uh, and come and join and post and 
we'll we'll be setting up our first meeting after on this build. So Jordan, are you going to bring out semantic version? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. As one of the things we were talking about, I, f I forgot about that. <laughs> one of the things we were talking about is uh, whether we need uh, semantic versioning to uh, to use, obviously, as a way to determine whether uh, two versions are compatible, <laughs> and whether we should consider consider that change. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I think there's a number of other reasons why we need to visit the whole semantic versioning uh, topic. Uh, Please give it a closer look. I'm all in favor of it. It could make things a lot. It could make sort of usability of this a lot, a lot better. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think semantic versioning is something we should we should try to tackle at some point. I agree. I agree. Agreed. Well, um, is there any other questions from uh, the web or from the Menlo Park office? Going once. So I have an unrelated uh, question, but just a general matter of uh, sort of TSP uh, foreshadowing, perhaps. Um, as many of you know, the, um, the services for Onos have been one by one transferred over to the Linux Foundation. Um, at this point, they've done uh, Jira, uh, Confluence, today was Garrett. Um, the next, uh, well, there's two more that, that are on our radar. One is Sonar and one is Jenkins. Uh, the Sonar should be relatively straightforward. Uh, Jenkins is going to be a bit of a mess. Um, the way that we're currently doing job management is that more or less a large swath of developers have access to the Jenkins UI and jobs are not being backed up. They're not really being added in sort of any sort of verified way. Um, and what we talked about with the Linux Foundation is uh, moving over to a, a managed Jenkins with them where jobs would be specified using uh, Jenkins job builder. So you write code that describes your, your job configuration that gets verified, code reviewed, and committed. Um, when that goes in, it automatically updates the, the Jenkins job. Um, I've asked Linux Foundation to do a tech talk on Jenkins Job Builder. Um, that's going to happen probably the, the TST on October 4th. Um, we still need to confirm that with them. Um, but basically, that's one of the services where we're, we're going to have to um, more or less migrate manually. Uh, and I think it's, it's actually going to be really good for the project. Oh, absolutely, um, yeah. To have these checked in uh, jobs. But um, I just wanted to give people a heads up. Um, if there are questions or concerns that people have, um, they can start to think about them over the next few weeks and uh, we'll, we'll talk about it on the 4th of October. Yeah, I, de I definitely think it's going to be a very, very nice change. First of all, it will offload uh, uh, the management of the infrastructure of, from our team, and it will also give more visibility to the entire community as to what's really happening as part of those those jobs, and they can start contributing. So this will empower the infrastructure brigade far more. Yep. So anyway, just thought I'd, I'd mention that while uh, this, this team's on. No, oh, this is great. Thanks, Brian. And again, thank you, Jordan. This was an excellent presentation. And I've read through the document. It's really, really nice. I presume it's going to continue to evolve, correct? As, as you, as the, as you Absolutely. brigade continues to, to um, refine your thoughts on this, I would definitely encourage you to um, keep it up to date because it's a very useful write-up. It's the, it's the right amount of detail, not too much, not too. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's definitely not TLDR. Let's put it that way. So. It's great. So thank you for putting that together. Okay, I'll post it in the uh, I'll post it on the TST wiki page. Perfect, perfect. And I'll link it. Uh, I'll link to it from the comments on the YouTube video once it's uploaded. Okay. All right. So does uh, let me actually ask if anybody has any other topics that they would like to bring up and discuss.
It's um, assuming the meeting next week is going to be canceled due to uh, attendance of uh, on those builds. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. So the next meeting will be two weeks from now. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and thanks a lot, Jordan. You guys have a great day. Bye. Bye. Bye.